Hello and welcome to the debate. I'm your host, Sana Makbul, with you at PTV World. And of course, with me are Farouk Fadafi and Raja Faisal. In today's show, we're going to be discussing the much-awaited date for elections, which is announced so far, um, perhaps not officially, but we have seen the, uh, the Election Commission of Pakistan um, and the President of Pakistan meeting with regards to consultations that were directed by the Supreme Court of the country uh, for the decision regarding the polls, uh, which has to be communicated in the courts tomorrow. And of course, this is going to be an important move ahead in terms of what exactly is going to be the plan of action and the schedule for polls and the much debated uh, controversy with regards to whether or not uh, the constitutional violation has occurred, especially with regards to the 90-day time uh, period, which now, of course, is something that seems to be uh, have let go of. Uh, with the date going to be given to the Supreme Court tomorrow. And it seems that uh, the discussions during the hearing held earlier today also pointed towards an agreement of moving ahead with the polls. We've also seen um, various leaders, um, particularly also from the PPP, speaking about how they're happy that the election date is announced, something that they've been asking for, but they're still awaiting an official announcement from the EZP. And there's also, of course, uh, concerns um, with regards to whether or not there needs to be a constitutional amendment regarding the matter so that nobody um, in the future can actually speak about the fact that these elections are not valid or that um, the elections um, in this whole process um, are something that can possibly be questioned. We also know that uh, the ECP is fully confident of the entire process of uh, the delimitations to be completed within this time period and has also talked about giving the public the option of a Sunday for the elections to be held so that they can increase the chance of more voters coming, of, of course with reference to the security situation plans have already been put in place but the question of course also remains so with reference to what exactly has happened and how will we be able to look back at the various instances particularly also with the president and the ECB that have taken place in the past and what sort of consequence they hold including the letter that was written by the president to the ECB earlier calling for elections to be held on the 6th of November uh, something to which there was a response that uh, it is not the decision of the president to actually move ahead with the date of the polls. Um, and so this question mark also still remains um, as to how this is going to be preceded. Um, with lawyers in the hearing today also speaking about how the deadline for the 90-day time period expires on November 7th, which of course is unclear since it seems that that deadline has already gone before that. So we're going to try and understand the current situation, especially in terms of its uh, legalities um, and then of course the political consequences of what lies ahead um, now that it seems that the, the, election, uh, the, the elections are certain and that this is a date that is going to be followed. So far, that is of course the case. It remains to be seen how exactly the situation is going to evolve. Of course, Farouk and Faisal are going to be part of the discussion, and we've also been joined online by our guest, Mr. Salaldin Safdir, who's spokesperson Parfin. We've also been joined by Barista Usama Khabar Guman, who's a legal expert, and also by Dr. Bakim Malik, who's a court affairs expert. We're going to be uh, taking a look at the particular issue with reference to what is going on in terms of uh, the situation um, uh, with reference to, of course, uh, the kind of conversations we've had in the past. And Osama, I'm going to start with you in terms of uh, the decision that has been taken, um, uh, it seems, between the president and the ECP, um, that there is, of course, a lot of agreement and consensus on what is actually going on. But I want to then understand, given the hearing that, of course, was in place um, and due to which this, these directives have actually been issued uh, by the president, what exactly is going to be the case moving forward in terms of any possible question marks that can be raised with reference to this particular date announcement or do you think that from this point onwards we can forget about that debate and move on with the elections as it seems to be? Um, uh, thank you, Sana. So I think uh, what uh, a positive thing about uh, today's hearing and, and which we have seen very recently, uh, especially after the assumption of Chief Justice Office by Kaji Fai Gisa, that there is a concerted effort and there is also a focus to move forward, to, to write and not to be held hostage but, uh, by what has happened before. And there were indications in today's hearing as well. Uh, so, so my assessment, I thought, answer to your question is, I think it is going to be more, uh, 
the court is going to be forward looking rather than be held hostage by what has happened before and here are my reasons so in today's hearing and uh, ptis and other parties petitioners there has been petitions pending they have been uh, agitating this matter that the election uh, needed to be held in 90 days uh now the court has clearly uh, the, the court has conveyed in the last hearing and today as, as well that the court can only be seized of a matter which is an alive matter so that 19 day bridge uh, that water has already passed under under the bridge so the courts are only required to adjudicate the matters that are before them they are not able, not supposed to adjudicate matters that are theoretical in nature there might be violation that is another separate question but there is another question before the court that okay it is a constitutional obligation to hold elections uh and wh- why those elections because if the court goes back and start adjudicating about the question that the whether the election was supposed to held by in 90 days who was supposed to give the date and why did not he give the that would open another can of worms as it was indicated in, in today's hearing as well then that would also mean that if ptl's position was accepted and their petition were uh, the arguments were accepted then 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 that would mean that the president abdicated his constitutional responsibility of giving uh, an election date uh, so and that would require another different types of adjudication whether the supreme court can hold uh, Uh, or declare that the president has abdicated his res- responsibility or violated the constitution because the constitution gives certain immunities to the office of the president it doesn't matter if he is a pti president or not pti president in fact the entire federation is run in the name of the president so that w- that is an other complicated matter due to host of constitutional jurisprudential reasons and that would again take time on the other hand uh, the court has taken a very very pragmatic approach they have sidestepped this debate that who is responsible for an, for an announcement of the date whether it is the president or whether it is the election commission so on and so forth what the court has uh, and the parties have showed willingness that they are interested in ho- holding election which is a, which is a positive development the election commission has indicated a certain date and to avoid this this very very contentious issue that who is supposed to be the authority announcing the date the court has found a middle way it has directed the election commission to consult yeah. the president and then come up with a, a, right. a formula Usama, or a date uh, right so some understand i understand i understand that a certain the certain aspect at this moment is more important than the other in terms of holding elections and i understand perhaps the question of um who really was the authority may be irrelevant at the given time but i want to understand only at this point that when we move on from this point onwards that a date has been announced and that we're proceeding towards elections do we then forget about the nuances that have been discussed do we forget about the constitutional amendments perhaps that was required do we forget that the president wrote a letter perhaps that he wasn't supposed to or was supposed to all of that will not will no longer be looked into <clears throat> oh um, no no I, so sana i i don't think uh, these things can be forgotten just like that there there has already been a very robust debate amongst newspapers on our tv channels but that is a separate issue so if someone thinks that there has been a constitutional violation then that is another petition and they should perhaps move the supreme court or the other constitutional courts but that is a separate cause of action in in our legal terminology that okay look there has been a violation and the yeah. court should adjudicate and then uh, that would require whether the court can adjudicate on these matters or not but the lesson that needs to be learned and and i think with today's proceedings that the constitution itself is not a guarantee if if there are no if there is no consensus amongst the political different political players and power uh, uh, power centers in in a polity if they do not want to abide by the rules yeah and then uh, the constitution cannot ensure uh, or protect uh, the rights in any any meaningful manner 
and we have right. seen that this has been a cat and mouse game being played for a right. while. Absolutely, so I, mean, I absolutely party. understand that, Osama, and and maybe I'm co completely off track here, but um, I just feel that that we're we're saying that okay, a, an argument uh, is being resolved, for example, and this is the solution. This is what's important. We're going to focus on this and. We'll talk about whatever happened later and, and if whoever was wrong, whoever was right later. Who's going to talk about that once you've already moved on with a solution to the problem and you've accepted that this is it? When are these issues ever going to be brought up and who's going to bring them up again um, when they're going to be so passed down the lane? Um, I, I, th I think it's some matters are left for to the political sphere because there's there was a positive development in a sense that a reverse debate so these these matters they are primarily political matters they are not strictly speaking legal matters that required a co conclusive resolution that requires a conclusive adjudication uh, we have been speaking here patafi saab and we have raised this issue number of times here that is an unfortunate reality, of, uh, especially of Pakistan, but it's a global yeah, phenomenon exactly. with the politics, judicialization of politics. These are political matters. They should be resolved in in uh, political arena. The courts are not by design equipped. Either They are not equipped. They don't have capacity. And it is not even desirable that in democracies, these matters need to be resolved in, in judicial arenas. <laughs> These are political matters, and political matters do not are not resolved instantaneously. Sometimes they take a long period of time, a uh, contentious debate, uh, to get resolved. And sometimes they, they they do not get resolved. That's also uh, an aspect of uh, politics. But there's there's some sort of negotiation. So these these matters they are negotiated over a period of time, and I see a form of negotiation here as well. That sometimes political opponents. Uh, uh, on different side of spectrums, they take maximalist positions, uh, which are really black and white. But once they negotiate, uh, negotiate either due to different strengths or due to the strengths of their arguments, so sometimes even the number of people who are on both sides, and the negotiations then compels them to accept certain political realities. On the other hand, courts uh, courts are not uh, in. Uh, they are not running a data. They are not running a Baba Rahmatayi Batak, where they are like uh, uh, bringing those parties and they say, okay, you give this one and the other party take this one and and the courts are uh, function in most of the time in relatively black and white terms. So in that sense, uh, I I I think that these are political matters and they will be resolved or not even resolved, but they, 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 there'll be progress on these matters and there'll be lessons to learn in coming times for us, for political okay. players, for historians. Right. All right. Let me also bring in the conversation, uh, Mrs. Slaudin, uh, given, of course, the fact that we're going to be proceeding um, towards elections. Um, these discussions are also relevant in terms of what is expected um, out, uh, um, out from the actual conduct of the elections as well. And it seems that during the hearing, the ECP has been very confident about the fact that uh, the delimitation process is going to be completed on time um, and they're going to be able to move ahead uh, with the time period as planned. And I want to understand your take on, on this given, given the current situation and give, given the different political parties' responses in the past. Uh, is it really as as planned out um, a, as how the ECB seems to be describing at the moment in terms of how it's going to happen um, and that there is going to be no road bumps on the way uh, to this particular date um, and we can be confident that whatever process needs to be completed will be done by them. Uh, thank you, Sana. Uh, before coming to uh, your question, uh, I would first like to uh, comment on the question uh, that you asked yeah. from Osama. Uh, that uh, uh, whether uh, what would be the constitutionality uh, of these elections held beyond the period of uh, 90 days. I think uh, the Article 254 of the Constitution is very clear. Uh, Osama can shed more light on it. That uh, if a certain act is to be done in a uh, specific uh, period mentioned in the Constitution, and it is not done in that period, the failure to do uh, uh, an act in a certain period does not 
uh, invalidate uh, the action uh, if it is taken uh, be, uh, after that period. So uh, mm. uh, I don't see uh, I don't see there uh, any issue with the constitutionality uh, of elections taking place uh, even after uh, the 90 day period timeline. Uh, actually, the important uh, is that actually, Mr. Stalin, I'm glad you, you I'm glad you spoke about this article and referred to this article because this article is honestly very confusing to me, at least if you could help someone like me understand exactly why this article um, is in place in terms of the fact that it allows for um, a certain time period to be violated, really? so to speak. Why is this not a time period? This article is not uh, uh, an allowance or a permission to, okay. uh, to discredit the constitutional timeline, but uh, this article uh, certainly uh, protects an action done, uh, an action that needs to be done. Uh, it protects uh, the validity of that action uh, taken after the right. Time. So it's validating so the violation, it. is it yep. not? Uh, coming uh, coming to the uh, yep. part, uh, the actual question that you asked me, uh, I think uh, this. Uh, this is this is fourth time that we are discussing this uh, uh, timeline of election on your program. Uh, first, there was complete uncertainty uh, in late August or early September. Then they started a debate with the president, writing a letter to the Election Commission of Pakistan and proposing November 6 as the date. Uh, then Election Commission announced uh, uh, that elections may be held by the end of January during the last week of January. Uh, th then uh, earlier today, there came a date of 11th February, then came a date uh, of 8th February. So uh, each development uh, w w was a step forward uh, to the holding of election uh, and, uh, and to dispelling the uncertainties and confusions around the date of election. Uh, and, I, and I think given the, uh, given the current situation, uh, the latest development uh, is the best possible solution that uh, there's a consensus between uh, between the president and the election commission uh, on a specific date and uh, uh, now the elections uh, but, uh, but the announcement even of uh, february 8th is still short of the uh, still short of legal uh, cover because as we discussed during our previous program uh, the announcement should come in form of a gazette notification it should, uh, according to Section 57 of the Elections Act, it should it should not come uh, as a press release or as an uh, as a media talk. But a good sure. thing is that this time, uh, but this time, uh, Supreme Court is the guarantor. Uh, 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 this assurance is being not given to the media, but it is being given uh, before the Supreme Court. So uh, uh, the Supreme Court will be the guarantor of uh, uh, of uh, guarantor that uh, elections will actually be held on this date. Uh, as uh, the judges were very uh, uh, vocal uh, today that they would not allow uh, a specific date that is given to the before the court uh, to be pushed further uh, away. So th that is a good thing, but still it is short of the legal cover as uh, the legal announcement through a gazette notification uh, would only be made after the delimitation process is complete and the constituencies are finalized then the election commission will, uh, will come up uh, with a gazette notification uh, and uh, following that gazette not notification three days after the notification there will be a uh, uh, an election schedule to be announced uh, uh, outlining the dates specific dates for the election mm -hmm. that when will be the nomination and scrutiny sure. uh, will be received but uh, right. apart from that uh, mm, uh, I was just thinking that uh, 10 years down the lane, uh, a decade after uh, mm, 2023, maybe 2033, uh, it would matter uh, little that elections were held on uh, February 8th or November 6th because there is only a gap of two months or uh, a couple of days between uh, any two days discussed here. What would matter is uh, the way we announced we decided this date. Uh, there has been a complete uncertainty, confusion, or right. rather, I would, I, I would call it a chaotic situation. Right, that absolutely. I, I understand what the point that you're making, Salahuddin Saab, but um, I, I'm, I'm sure you understand that it's not just a matter of days or months. It's about principle, really, and it's the Constitution that we're talking about. Uh, but I'll come da back to that later with Osama as well. Faisal, the situation, given, of course, some sort of certainty that has uh, now been given to us and different political parties as well. Um, uh, we've also heard within the hearing, the BTS Council was also spoken uh, to uh, with reference to whether it would like 
like to have elections now or not um, and they respond in the affirmative the PPP also seems to be uh, claiming uh, that this is something that they they have been asking for and that they're very happy to hear that whatever it may be the way that it has been achieved um, and so has been the family and so I want to understand then um, given given this, this certainty at the moment how exactly do you think that these parties are going to move ahead particularly of course the PTI as well and the question of a level playing field that was that was being asked um, uh, so, so previously multiple times what exactly will then that scenario be if we're agreeing with the election date of course we're agreeing with the current circumstances as well Yes, Anad, the, the, the situation is quite uh, interesting right now, of course. Uh, and uh, uh, if we talk about the level playing field, of course, there was uh, one party, PMLN, that uh, has been asking for level playing field for a long time. And now, once, of course, they have been provided with the level playing field, of course, they are uh, se all set and ready for the elections. And if we talk about the rest of the political parties, of course, now they are asking for the level playing field as well. Uh, if we talk about People's Party, if we talk about PTI as a political party, if we talk about uh, uh, you know uh, Jamaat Islami, all of them, of course, all of them they need, uh, they require a level playing field, which means that uh, they should be sort of given uh, the similar air times and uh, you know similar uh, opportunities to meet with the vo their voters and of course uh, highlight what they want to. Uh, achieve after getting into power and uh, why they want to win the elections and what are the uh, matters which they uh, keep uh, very dear to themselves which are uh, necessary to be dealt uh, of course uh, in the larger interest of the people of Pakistan <coughs> but uh, Sana uh, obviously overall if I talk about it of course I have been listening both of the uh, worthy guests we have today of course both of them they were, uh, you know, hailed from right uh, in the middle of the Constitution and law. They are, you know, every day uh, talking about it and uh, reading about it and everything. Mm. But me being a journalist, I would, uh, you know, uh, peep into whatever has been happening since almost 18 months in this uh, uh, in this country. I would uh, start with uh, whatever happened with the previous uh, uh, government. I'm talking about the PTI's government, end days of PTI's government. I mean, they uh, sort of, uh, uh, you know, uh, brought allegations against uh, the other parties that they have been obviously, uh, you know, stealing their members from uh, the parliament. And uh, that was, they thought it was, uh, uh, should be considered as illegal. And uh, of course, they did not want the no confidence vote to, uh, you know, be successful. Eventually, we saw that it was successful, then they, they were not, uh, you know, agreeing with it, then or everything went into, into Supreme Court at that time, and then Supreme Court came up, uh, obviously, in the favor of PDM, and that's how PDM's government, uh, you know, it came into, uh, 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 you know, on, on Constitution Avenue, and uh, we had a, a new premier, and after that, of course, uh, there was nothing which was being agreed upon by the PTI as an opposition party at that time. We know that they started uh, giving their resignations. Every single thing which has been taking place, it mm. was extraordinary, which we have been seeing. And of course, when we talk about, oh, uh, constitution requires that within uh, 90 days of the uh, time, I mean, the Punjab Assembly's elections should have been, uh, uh, you know, held, and then KPK's elections should have been held within the time frame of 90 days, and why didn't it take place? And then uh, we talk about by-elections as well. So there were, the system was actually trying to give uh, you know, notions to PTI as a uh, as a party uh, that we are intact, and of course, you will be given the opportunity. And here is the by-election, and it was free and fair. And we saw that they did win the majority seats, which was a sort of uh, you know uh, given uh, a surety that, of course. Uh, free and fair elections is the eventual thing which is going to take place. But what right. we saw later on that there was, uh, you know, resistance from their side and uh, aggression we saw from PTI's side. And then 9th May, whatever happened on 9th, 9th May, it was all cooking for almost more than a year. And it, uh, you know, the pressure cooker got burst on 9th of May and everything it actually makes me think that it was extremely extraordinary time on Pakistan. Right. When it was extremely extraordinary time on Pakistan, 
then constitution of Pakistan is part of Pakistan of course and then constitution of Pakistan had to see the extraordinary measures as well being taken and that is why we are standing where, uh, where we are standing right okay. now. The only thing I would conclude is that we should be very happy that we, are, we did not see uh, you know anything lesser than democracy and democracy okay eventually will prevail even uh, you know if prevails in uh, january or february or march but now we are sure that democracy will prevail eventually and whatever the government comes into power of course it would be government of the people by the people for the people of course and hopefully that is the case um farooq when we take a look at this situation i'm sure you have uh, uh, responses to all of the previous <laughs> questions as well but I'll, I'll just give you a simple one um also um uh, and uh, add that in the list um you've been sharing your uncertainty your your doubts with whether or not there is going to be uh, the, an election um in the given time frame <coughs> uh, whatever was being given earlier than this and now we have a date uh, also uh, that has been there does that give you any assurance that this is actually something that's going to happen then or are there still uh, some uh, options for doubt? Right, uh, Sena, uh, thank you very much for the question and I think that uh, uh, I wasn't actually expressing uh, my concerns regarding uncertainty. Okay. My, my question was why is there uncertainty right? mm. uh, that this date should have been announced and I uh, the, the biggest concern that I had was that uh, no matter whosoever actually spoke, the biggest problem was the one that the one that was actually supposed to offer a date in terms of practical nature of things, logistically, is the election commission. Mm. And it hasn't given that date at all or indicated its readiness to hold the election. So that was the question. Now that the date is before us, I'm very confident. Mm. Okay. And I'm uh, grateful to the uh, you know, Supreme Court of Pakistan for clarifying many things that were unclear mm. before. Perhaps because of the nature of polarization of the country, perhaps because of the nature of polarization of the judiciary mm. or um, our institutions per se. Uh, now let me also uh, you know, talk to Osama and tell him uh, uh, earlier the questions that you were actually subjected to uh, Osama. Uh, uh, Sana is very sharp and in <laughs> her very polite, the inquisitive way, she was taking to task everybody yeah. uh, among us who were actually sort of peddling around the issue of dates <laughs> in the past. So uh, she, she did that and I think that uh, I don't uh, hold any brief for the constitution or legal system. But I just wanted to warn you that she is going to keep on zeroing in yeah. on that issue. <laughs> uh, uh, regarding, uh, you know, my understanding of things, Sana, I never actually, I kept on telling you that uh, uh, it is best uh, resolved by the, you know, cost the constitutional experts, mm -hmm. especially the Supreme Court of Pakistan. Yeah. But uh, uh, because I'm a student of political science, I had my own real politic understanding or reasons. Uh, like um, uh, my brother here, Faisal, actually explained to you, but my mind was very simple. You know, uh, because the country was so damn pol polarized mm. uh, in the past one and a half year, many things actually threatened to end up on the ballot yeah. that were not supposed to be there. For example, appointment of an army chief. Mm. It is not a political issue. It is an institutional issue. And uh, because Imran Khan Saab was actually pushing for an early election, especially that's why he dissolved the assembly in Punjab, uh, and Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, and he wanted the uh, uh, assembly to be dissolved at the center. The fear was that perhaps that issue might end up on the ballot. And in the current war and terrorist situation, that would have meant only one thing, appeasement of the terrorist threat. Uh, so um, I'm, I was okay with that. Then, of course, uh, another thing we knew that there is something cooking up and something is going to explode. So I'm grateful that the elections were not held uh, before May 9th because uh, on May 9th things could have gone all right, yeah. uh, right? Uh, and then the third one, and by the way, that was the most important one. Uh, and that was the Supreme Court's uh, elevations actually end ending up on ballot. We know that a good man was persecuted. We know that that uh, good man was about to be elevated to the uh, you know, chair uh, of uh, uh, you know 
uh, head of uh, the Supreme Court. And there was a possibility that uh, with all that mumbo jumbo, uh, that could have been derailed. And I cannot tell you, Sana, when especially that persecution was taking place, how much people like me were under pressure to actually berate him. And we refused. Luckily, the system shielded us and we, were, we are around. But because uh, September came and that allegation actually took place as well, after that, I had no issue with the date at all. And that is when I started expressing my concerns that elections should not be indefinitely uh, you know, delayed. Okay. Now you have the, uh, the kind of people who actually command and unite. Um, you have seen the Supreme Court. It has led through moral leadership. The day Justice, uh, Chief Justice actually was elevated to the post through open, uh, open court, live transmission, <coughs> the full, uh, you know, uh, the entirety of uh, bench actually sitting together. Whether they agreed or not, that is a, uh, something beside it. Similarly, uh, when you talk about army also, all the people who actually could have actually played a negative role are sidelined. So at this moment, I think my country is healthier. But do I uh, act as an apologist for people who kept on saying that election uh, announcement date is not president's prerogative or this person's or that person's? I mean, we could obfuscate, but we could not actually keep on lying, right? right. So I cannot actually hold apology for anybody. And uh, if I do, uh, what I said was, came across as something dishonest, I must apologize. But I think my country is healthier for it. Mm. Right. Uh, Barrister Sama, a um, quick question with reference to the um, Article 254. I want to understand um, there is there was also a discussion um, and a media talk by a political leader uh, talking about how a constitutional amendment would be required uh, so that nobody actually raises objections in the future. I want to understand if, if Article 254 in itself sort of provides that validation. Why is it that the question of a constitutional amendment is being raised? Uh, Sena, I, th I think it's um, Patafi Sab has made my task really, really easy. Uh, so so there, there are two issues and we should not separate, uh, we should not muddle them. The one is, uh, is the uh, command and the issue uh, of holding elections within 90 days. And the other is, uh, it's there, uh, if for some reason, if those elections are not held within the constitutional command, would those constitution would those elections be illegal or unconstitutional? So Article 254, it's uh, it has been unfortunately used as a tool, uh, a deliberately used to muddle the debate. It is a standard as as uh, I I trust that you would take it from me as a student of law. I have been practicing law for a while now, which is a standard clause which exists in almost every other legislation. The purpose of this clause, the, this clause is that if sometimes if the constitution or any other statute provides a certain uh, doing of something within a certain period, and if it is not it, if it is not able to be done for some force majeure reason or some some reasons which are which have to be extraordinary then that action would not be uh, contrary to law or would not be declared void of an issue so there's also there are certain actions and i think it is it is a clause to more save it unfortunately this clause was used as a justification yeah. to delay to deliberately and so this 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 has never been the purpose. This is a clause which is found in almost every jurisdiction, almost every constitution of the world. This is a very novel situation, and perhaps our contribution, the Pakistan's contribution to world jurisprudence, that we preemptively uh, use, utilize a clause which was a saving clause to delay the election deliberately and many months in advance, use it as a weapon. So I think this was a very dishonest, disingenuous uh, argument. Uh, this is a standard clause, so there's no uh, room to use okay. it. There are, other, there can be other, perhaps more legitimate reasons. So I don't think that there is any need for constitutional amendment. 
All right. Fact, Thank you for that. Should exist, uh, all right. Like all right. We're, we're almost uh, out of time, so I'll, I'll quickly go to Salahuddin Saab as well. Um, Salahuddin Saab, the, the, of course, the, the way that we want any elections to be held in the country is what is referred to as free and fair elections. And this is something, of course, that I'm sure uh, bodies such as the ECP work towards um, and all institutions aspire to and all political leaders and the nation hopes for. But irrespective of um, what political parties on the losing end might say after the conduct of the elections, what can organizations as the, such as the FAFIN do at this moment in time to sort of help support the ECP in actually conducting these elections in a free and fair manner? And how confident are you in the current preparations uh, and the timelines that are being given as to how exactly this is then going to be conducted on ground. Uh, sir, actually the election process has uh, legally not begun uh, as, of, uh, <clears throat> as of now. The election process sure. will begin after, uh, after the announcement of election schedule. Once the election schedule is announced, then the law gives wide-ranging powers to the Election Commission of Pakistan uh, to, to take uh, any action that is uh, required uh, to ensure that the elections are held free, fair, just, and in accordance with the law. Uh, right, but shouldn't the recommendations the of holding it in a free and fair manner come before they, uh, the schedule actually starts? The recent, so, so, so I was just uh, coming to that point. The recent okay. amendments in the Elections Act uh, uh, have even enhanced those powers even more. Now the Election Commission uh, uh, has the power even to initiate uh, criminal proceedings against any person uh, uh, who the commission thinks is interfering in the uh, conduct of free and fair polls. So uh, election commission should be seen using these powers. These powers are not uh, uh, to be kept in, uh, kept in the papers and uh, to be ignored. Uh, actually, these powers, uh, the election commission is the most powerful institution uh, during this entire uh, period of election schedule. So the commission should be seen using this power to ensure that uh, these elections are uh, held to be fair and in, in accordance with the law. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Slaudin Safta, for joining us. And thank you, Barrister Osama, uh, for joining us and being a part of the debate as well. We're now going to be moving on to our next segment, which takes a look at uh, the uh, very important issue of the involvement of uh, Indian state terrorism and the crimes that have been conducted. And recently, we've had a number of people actually get together and speak about this in Pakistan as well, where different discussions were held regarding uh, the FATF's impact on South Asia and what exactly is going to be uh, the move forward by the FATF um, in its evaluation that is due within this month um, in India and what exactly are going to be the consequences of that and what sort of considerations need to be looked into, including, of course, the fact that uh, a number of queries, um, about 330 that have been raised previously by this watchdog haven't even been answered. Uh, meanwhile, Pakistan, of course, has responded uh, to each and every query that has been raised. And more importantly, of course, the involvement um, of uh, the Indian politics into the illegal activities and financial crimes within the country as well. And how exactly is this connection then going to be looked into and sorted? And Faisal, let me start with you with reference to, of course, this discussion uh, is important, especially in terms of the way that Pakistan also, unfortunately, has to deal with the consequence of these illegal activities activities within India and the FATF's evaluation in this matter is extremely important as to, to keep perhaps more scrutiny on the matter. But do you think that even though that we have seen previously also a number of queries being raised and no response being given that the FATF will be able to dig as deep as um, is needed and will be able to look into the Indian political involvement as well? Yes, and if we uh, obviously talk about uh, the uh, you know task force, they have asked 330 questions and these 330 questions are of course related to in recent times, in uh, the recent decade we have seen. Of course, they have been doing uh, lots of things throughout the world, not only within uh, uh, India, <coughs> they have been doing it throughout the world. I mean, uh, Hardeep Sim Singh Nijar is one example that got highlighted. Kulbushan Jadav is another example which keeps on highlighting everywhere. And then, of course, there are uh, more examples in which uh, in Kenya they are involved, in the Middle Eastern countries they are involved in money laundering and uh, uh, God knows how many things they are involved in, especially related to, you know, selling arms and illegal arm trades. And by the way, when we talk about the illegal arm trade, I mean, there are 42 incidents, reported incidents or, uh, in India which are reported by within India as well. I mean, their own uh, newspapers, they highlighted it. I'm talking about 42 times uranium was sold, I mean, half kg uranium in a, in a shopping bag 
that was sold, one kg was sold, and these sort of 42 incidents, who was buying that uranium and what for? I mean, can it get in the hands of, uh, you know, ISIS or somewhere? where obviously they will be able to use it against the humanity, against uh, the world at large. I mean, I know ISIS and uh, Hinditwa and, uh, you know, uh, Zionism, all of these ideologies, they are the uh, uh, evil ideologies of this world. And of course, if these kind of weapons, they get into their hands, of course they will be using uh, against uh, all of us. I mean, I'm not, uh, you know, uh, making uh, segregations and, uh, you know, uh, this won't be used against them and that it would be against uh, be used against the humanity at all uh, and by the way you know very recently we went through another case in which eight of their uh, uh, <coughs> former navy uh, personnel they were actually caught and of course they've been handed with the uh, uh, death sentences in qatar mm. and they were in, involved in spying and of course uh, you know they were spying for israel i mean uh, uh, officers right. officers of indian navy they are working for a third country yeah. and uh, of course somehow we know that both of the countries they have very good relations when it comes to intelligence sharing when it comes to right. uh, weapon sharing right and and all that. I, I'm glad you spoke <coughs> about about what we know in the situation yeah. and of course it's it, this is something that then of course is not something that only we are privy to um, mm -hmm. let me also welcome in the debate dr. Bakir uh, Malik who's joined us um, online he's a foreign affairs expert thank you very much for joining us dr. Sabin being part of the discussion and of course um, as you heard we, we are talking about the way that the FATF is going to look into uh, mm -hmm. the involvement of uh, financial crime within the country and of course the political situation with with big businessmen also involved uh, with the BJP government and I want to understand then what sort of a role can be played with regards to how this is brought to light what Faisal was just referring to about how apparent or obvious things are um, is this something that that is not uh, that is not very clear to a body such as the FATF as well and what will be then the consequence of such evaluations as we haven't seen much done in the past will we be able to see that after this one Can you hear me? Uh, yes. Yes, go ahead. Okay. Uh, sorry, can you repeat a question? Maybe there is some signal problem because I have not. No problem. Uh, Dr. Bakir, the, the question is that when we talk about the FATF evaluation in India, which is due this month, I want to understand, given the involvement that is so clear to us in terms of the Indian uh, political elite and the b elite business community being involved in financial crimes within the country and outside the country as well, what do you expect is going to be the consequence of this evaluation in terms of what, what is happening and how closely will the FATF will be able to look into these issues and actually do something about it? Uh, you know, uh, the basic purpose of this F FTF is uh, uh, just to monitor two things. One is uh, anti-money laundering law. Uh, second is basically, uh, you can say, uh, counter-financing terrorism. Uh, so if you just study these two law, uh, two terms of the FATA, then we have a two main uh, case study and that where we can also raise our issue that how India is basically involved in like a, a money laundering or something like a counter-financing terrorism. For example, um, uh, last year you have seen that there was a report word is issued uh, from this uh, American security exchange, security companies, uh, what we call a Hindenburg report. According to this report, uh, Adani Group was involved in a money laundering uh, where they were basically uh, uh, having some kind of uh, illegal money transfer in the stock market in, in, a, uh, in a stock market. Uh, so uh, after that, uh, this Adani Group was basically uh, you can say uh, their position was uh, uh, suddenly down in uh, India. Uh, but after a two or three months, uh, Narendra Modi was fully supportive to the Adani group and uh, it regained its position. And even some analysts believe that uh, it was because of the Narendra Modi, uh, the, the, this Adani group got this uh, contract of the Hefa port uh, from the Israel. Uh, so I think if you just study uh, 
this this one report of the hindenburg report this is a clear indication that indian government is a fully involved in this money laundering and this uh, uh, adani group is a basically a frontman of the narendra modi and second right. uh, maybe you have not noticed notice like this for example there's a sikh leader killing in the canada uh, it mean india is giving something money for basically to promote a kind of terrorism because uh, when canada uh, canada say that we have a proper evidence like that uh, india is involved by this uh, sikh leader, uh, killing of the sikh leader it means they have some evidence about and even when right. i was talking uh, uh, some right, of my canadian friends uh, they were your point taken sorry um, Unfortunately, Dr. Parker, we're out of time, but thank you very much for joining us and being a part of the discussion as well. And Farooq, quickly, I'll also take your input into mm -hmm. this. And um, yes, unfortunately, quickly, because we're almost out of time. And I want to understand then. Unfortunately, quickly, or unfortunately, take my point of view. We're wasting time <laughs> okay, as yeah, we speak. And we're yeah, 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 kidding. Yeah. Go ahead. And we're okay. zooming out the camera on you. Right. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Farouk, okay. Yes. Uh, so I'm going to actually begin and almost end my my intervention. by quoting uh, martin luther king right mm -hmm. the arc of moral uh, universe is long but it bends in the right direction uh, in the direction of justice right mm -hmm. uh, so my my humble submission regarding what has happened is that uh, finally chickens are coming home to roost yes. uh, india has been actually uh, dilly dallying on the issue of financial accountability sana in 2020 there was a fincen data dump right financial uh, crimes enforcement um, uh, you know so organization and they actually found that 44 of india's banks yeah. had uh, you know uh, been laundering money to the tune of 1 billion dollars yeah. and where did the money go we don't know yeah. and in the age of uh, cryptocurrencies it could have been much more and it could have been actually uh, supporting every kind of neo nazis in the world yeah. so now Uh, that uh, you know FATF is actually finally going to audit uh, India we have to see how India responds but honestly because the timing is so interesting India's elections are coming and all of a sudden all these things are you know uh, coming in that direction so what i uh, told you the other day that there is a possibility that India's deep state is readying itself uh, to dump modi and after that they can actually pick up somebody and they can move with that uh, mm -hmm. so that is perhaps what is going to happen at this moment i think <coughs> fatf's uh, work on india will be crucial in identifying how india might be contributing to mm -hmm. the unhinged world very true right absolutely thank you for that farooq and thank you faisal for also being part of the debate as always that's all that we have for the show we'll see you tomorrow